So back to, back to membranes. A lot of this stuff is going to be review and reinforce over materials that, and information we covered in the first chapters, but we're going to add two. We're going to get into more detail. So membranes, what do they do? Define boundaries. Boundaries of what? Cell. Cell. Organelles. So we compartmentalize. And we compartmentalize based on functions. And in our membranes, we're going to have proteins. The proteins function in transport, regulation, receptors, and cell-cell communication. Now again, this is going to be between cells and between compartments within the cell. Because even in our little diagram of mitochondria and ADP and phosphate in and ATP out, you, you can see how we're communicating the inside and outside of the cytoplasm and the inside of the mitochondria. And so in our discussion of membranes, when we look at the plasma membrane, for instance, how many lipid layers do we have? How many lipid layers do we have? Two. It's a lipid bilayer. So when we look at those lipid layers, we're going to have one of our polar groups of our lipid layer on the outside. They're referring to that as the exoplasmic face. And then the blue line that you see is toward the cytoplasmic part. So for our membranes, we are going to have a exoplasmic face and a cytoplasmic face. We have the same with our ER, our Golgi, and our lysosomes because they have one lipid bilayer. But in this case, the cytoplasmic face, of course, is facing the cytoplasm, but this exoplasmic face faces the inside of that particular organelle. See, now the blue is always going to be adjacent to the cytoplasm, but now this pink, the exoplasmic, is facing inside the ER, inside of our lysosome, or inside of our Golgi, which we don't have illustrated here. Does that make sense? But what happens when we have a double membrane? such as what we see here in the nucleus or what we see with the mitochondria. You have the four lipid layers. So we're going to have still the cytoplasmic on the outside. But now look, we also have what is essentially a cytoplasmic that's facing the very inside of our mitochondria. And those two exoplasmic layers create the space, this, this mitochondria, the outer mitochondrial space, or we've got our internuclear space between our internuclear membrane. Now, understand that's also going to be the case for our chloroplasts as well in plants. So do you see how we're creating those compartments? And you have to keep track of where each of those lipid layers lie in our single membrane and our double membrane organelles. So... Let's get into some of the properties and characteristics of membranes. Again, kind of going back and reviewing. Phospholipids, are they charged or are they nonpolar? Both. You're getting, you're getting my tricks. Since they're both, what, what could we call a phospholipid? What type of molecule? Amphipathic. They're amphipathic. So they have both a polar and a nonpolar region. That's amphipathic. And so when we look at membranes back in the uh, late 1800s, somebody said, you know what? Lipid-soluble molecules are pretty good at, at going through these. Lipid-soluble, nonpolar, hydrophobic. They can go through, but this polar stuff, water-soluble, can't. That has to do with that middle part those fatty acid chains, fatty acid molecules, hydrocarbons, what, what kind of molecules are those? Classify those. 
hydrophobic. And what's our other, our A word for hydrophobic? Aliphatic. So that's going to prevent water-soluble molecules from, from popping in there. Well, 1925, scientists said, you know what? These things, these things are made out of lipids, phospholipids. So let's, let's take the phospholipids out and weigh them and, and see what we got. Well, they end up with twice as many as they expected. How did they get twice as many? Lipid bilayer, 1925. They came up, oh, well, there's two of these critters. They must be arranged like an Oreo cookie. See where I'm getting that estimation. 1950s. They said, whoa, look, look at this thing. There's actually three lines when we look using what kind of microscope? Electron, Electron microscope. We're, we're getting really close here. What, what in the world is giving us these three lines of the cell membrane? How, how do we get three lines of our plasma membrane when we look with electron microscope? We get the phosphate, the charge part binds metal ions better. That's the dark lines. And guess what doesn't bind the metal so well? The fatty acid chains, the hydrophobic region. So that's where we see this three-layer look to our normal single membrane, but the lipid bilayer. You see how we're building all this evidence up as we're gaining more and more and using more and more technology. 1972, back in the 70s, doesn't seem that long ago, but it was a long time ago. This is where the fluid mosaic model came into play, where proteins embedded in the membrane, cholesterols, the phospholipids even, they're not in concrete. They're not immovable. They're continually moving around. And the membrane is made up of a lot of different things. In fact, there are 50 times more phospholipid molecules than proteins, yet proteins make up half the mass of the membrane because they're bigger. They're just more of the phospholipids. So let's look at our membrane lipids. And again, we're going to go into a little more detail now. We introduced them, phospholipids, glycolipids. Glyco means what? Sugar. And then we get our sterols. And what's our sterol in our body? Cholesterol. See how we're using that information to build on it now? That's why we did that in the first unit. So phospholipids. Here's our typical phospholipid that we have. Fatty acid chains. How many? Two. How many are we going to, how many fatty acid chains do we have in triglycerides? Triglycerides, three. Phospholipids are going to have two. Our anchoring molecule is a glycerol group. And then on that we have our phosphate. That's where we get our phospholipids. And that phosphate can bind to a lot of different things. Choline, serine, threonine, and it can bind a bunch. But when you have this organization, we call it a phosphoglyceride. That is a phosphoglyceride. And this is going to be real common in plants and bacteria. But in the human body, we have a different arrangement. We have, instead of a glycerol group, we have this molecule called sphingosin. Sphingosin is what binds to the phosphate, and sphingosin also binds to the fatty acid chain. But look at this tail of sphingosin. What, what does that look like? That, that's another hydrocarbon chain. That looks like another fatty acid, and it's exactly right. And so the sphingosin binds the phosphate that then binds to choline, serine, threonine, and acetal. The only difference is the glycerol group is common for plants and bacteria. The sphingosin form is common in animals and humans. Yeah, it is. See, there's an H there. Yep, there's an H. Okay. You don't see that H? You need glasses checked. <laughs> yes, there's an H. But essentially, the same phospholipids.
Now for our glycolipids, again, we see our sphingosin fatty acid, that's our base. But instead of a phosphate attached, we have a galactose. Galactose is a type of sugar, carbohydrate, glyco. So there's our glycolipids. And typically it's going to be galactose or glucose. We may in other cases have others, but those are the more common ones that we're going to play with with animal cells. And see, looks about the same. Fatty acid chains, hydrophobic, aliphatic. The sugar is going to be polar. We can interact with water here. We're not going to interact with water-soluble molecules with the tails. That, that's just the sphingosin plus the fatty acid. That, that's just what that base group is called as a ceramide. The last group of our lipids in our membranes are the sterols. Cholesterol in plants is our sterol. I mean, plants is phytosterols. In animals, it's cholesterol. All right. And you can see with either this space filling model or here with our ring model, we're basically going to have hydrocarbon rings and chains that has a polar group on the very end. But this is going to be bent. It's going to be fatter, shorter, stockier than our fatty acids, than our phospholipids. And that's going to have an impact on the packing of molecules in the membrane, which is going to affect the fluidity of the membrane we're going to see. So here's, here's our picture before with our polar groups interacting with water and water-soluble molecules on the outside and the inside. Not a very thick plasma membrane. 7 to 10 nanometers is the thickness of our plasma membrane. What, uh, what's our diameter of a red blood cell? Eight. 8 microns. 8 micrometers. Here we are down to nanometers. Nanometers, because we're, we're talking quite small. So we mentioned phospholipids and proteins. Here we can look at sort of uh, ratios by weight. So a human red blood cell, 49% protein, 43% lipid, okay, about half the mass. Once we get into a liver cell, 54 and 36, an amoeba, 54, 42, we get a ratio protein to lipid in the neighborhood of one to one and a half. Now, when we look at a bacteria, that's going to change a lot of stuff. Bacteria, 75% protein, 25% lipid, which gives us a ratio of three. Why, why is that interesting? You remember our mitochondria? We talked about this endosymbiosis. And possibly the mitochondria was a free-living prokaryotic organism with its own DNA that came and set up this relationship inside a eukaryotic cell. Well, when you look at the outer mitochondrial membrane, that if that were to happen, it would have picked it up from its host. Look at the ratio, 1.2. But if it was a prokaryotic cell, the inner mitochondrial membrane would look like a prokaryotic membrane, ratio of 3.5. Now, again, a tenant size, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, poops like a duck, it's probably a duck. Doesn't mean it is a duck, but you're building a case for it to be a duck. So there's, there's a lot of evidence to suggest those kinds of relationships that it possibly happened in the past. Now, fluid mosaic model. The membrane is fluid. The membrane moves. Proteins float around. Lipids are very active in the membrane as well. Your phospholipids can spin. They can just spin around, rotate. Woo. They can float from one place to another. But lipids can also dive underwater. Whoop! They can transversely diffuse or flip from one membrane to the next or one layer to the next layer and flip back and forth. So very, very fluid. But even though we're having all of this and this flipping back and forth, this transverse diffusion, 
What do you think the net transverse diffusion of phospholipids is? Zero. Because you've got as many flipping down as they are flipping up. So how does it not let anything get in if it's like all moving around? Because this layer, no matter what's flipping back and forth, is hydrophobic. You've got those chemical interactions that the polar molecules, I mean, it's, you know, it's just not going to go. Because they're not all doing it at once. Now, how do we know all this stuff is happening? How, how do we know phospholipids move? Well, this really cool experiment where they actually labeled phospholipids with fluorescent dye, fluorescent microscopy, right? And then they took a very, very pinpoint laser and they bleached the fluorescent molecule. You know how you do the glow sticks, you know, at Halloween and stuff, and in time they fade and you can't see them anymore? Well, a laser can actually make the fading happen a lot faster. So they zap it with a laser, and you can see in our spot, we jock down the intensity a lot. But then they watch and observe over time that some of these fluorescent molecules on the outside fill in the hole. So that's the phospholipids diffusing and moving around, and that's how we know, looking at a living cell, that in fact the phospholipids move, float, like we illustrated in our previous graphic. Now, membrane fluidity. Membranes move. They're, they're going to be fluid. Now we want to look at how our membranes stand up to temperature. So if we look at our membranes, and let's just look at this one uh, for a, we'll just say this is a normal membrane. There we are at you know, 28 degrees centigrade, so to speak. So at this point with our membrane, it's composition of phospholipids, sterols. If you get colder than this temperature, your membranes are going to become a gel, more solid, like ice. If we get warmer than 28 and above, our membrane is going to turn into a liquid. So this intermediate part is we're not a solid and we're not a full-blown liquid. We're just kind of gooey, I guess. Stuff can move around. And depending on the composition of your fatty acid chains will determine where we find this melting temperature that it's called. So here in our illustration, here we have a membrane that is rich in a fatty acid chain called oleate. Here we have a membrane that's rich in a hydrocarbon that is called sterate. Based on what you know about fats, saturated and unsaturated, could you guess which of these is going to contain more or less saturated or unsaturated fats, and why did you guess that? This, this is saturated, and this is unsaturated? Okay, why? But why, why does the saturated, unsaturated make a difference? Unsaturated wouldn't be able to move as much because it has the double bonds. Okay, so you're 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 good at examining the individual molecules. Now, what I want you to shift away from that line of thinking: what physical characteristics of those fatty acid chains happen because of the double bonds? Mm, again, we're thinking about that individual. Isn't unsaturated, like, and the polyunsaturated more solid? No, unsaturated is like more of a liquid. Okay, let's, let's, do this. let's do this. Saturated fats only have what bonds? Single. Single bonds. What do those fatty acid chains look like? Straight. Straight. Wiggly. Bent. What causes the bend? The double bond. The double bond. When you have all these straight chains, you can pack them closer together. 
when you have a bend or a lot of bends, that fatty acid chain is going to take up more space in the membrane. So within a certain area, you can pack more saturated fatty acid chains closer together and they're more dense versus more double bonds, more unsaturated or polyunsaturated. You have fewer molecules in a particular space. How is that going to affect temperature, melting temperature? Is it going to be harder or easier to melt a patch of membrane that's got a lot more fats, or is it easier or harder to melt a patch of membrane that doesn't have as many because they're bent? Exactly. The one that's not packed as tight, you can melt easier. The one that's packed more tightly because they're saturated is going to require more energy to melt. Come on. So, there's our saturated. Sterate is more saturated. Oleate is going to contain more unsaturated fatty acid chains. So, here's our number of double bonds relative to the melting point of our membrane. So the more double bonds you have, the lower the melting temperature because it's easier. They're not packed as tight. Here's another piece of information to add on top of that. The longer your hydrocarbon chain, the greater the number of carbons, what's happening to our melting temperature? It's increasing because it's more stuff. It's more dense. So the longer the chains, the more they're saturated, the higher the melting temperature must be in a particular membrane. You throw cholesterol into that short, squatty, bent cholesterol, that's going to also move that membrane apart. But it's not going to be as, as sort of black and white as this because cholesterol really is a temperature buffer to help maintain the fluidity, fluidity of the membrane. So if I showed you this picture first, you'd have probably got it, right? The straight chains pack closer together. When you have the bend, see the space? That's what makes it easier to melt when we look at packaging more of the saturated or more of these unsaturated into a particular membrane. And again, we're talking phospholipids. I mean, whether it's glycolipids or we're talking about the sphingolipids or the... Uh, the glycolipids, the glycerol-rich phospholipids, that would be a problem. Is this a problem? You ever heard of trans fats? Mm -hmm. Trans fats, good or bad? bad? Bad. They're bad. Because look at the trans fat. It mimics, what, what, is it, what are we mimicking here? The straight, the saturated. We're going to pack in tight, but guess what? Your body can't break that down. It's not naturally occurring. Trans fats are not naturally occurring. It's mechanically and chemically engineered. And when that hits your body, you can't break it down. So, uh, yeah, all kind of bad stuff. So what do, um, what do the hydrogens represent? This is the direction or where they exist in space. See, normally, <coughs> normally when you have a double bond in oh, nature... Right. Yeah, you get that bend, that kink, because the hydrogens are on that side. But in this case, because it's just mechanically engineered, it's engineered to be like this to affect taste or whatever other properties they have in the food. That's why you can't, your body can't break it down, and it causes a lot of problems. That's why when you look at your processed food, if you don't have processed food, you're not going to have trans fat. It's another problem with processed food. But always check that trans fat and you want to avoid foods that have trans fats.